Um, thanks for coming along this, this evening. Um, folks, uh, as Gavin said, this is a short series. It started off that it was going to be just a one-off talk about chaplains. But when I started looking at the material, I was finding it difficult trying to decide who to include and who not to include. So it's transmogrified into becoming a, a talk that's going to be about one talk on Presbyterian chaplains. Next week, there'll be a talk about Church of Ireland chaplains. And at a date yet to be decided, there'll be a talk about Roman Catholic chaplains. That's going to be done by um, Michael Nugent, Associate Member at History Hub Ulster. The only reason we're not doing any on Methodists is because I couldn't actually find enough information and uh, members of the Methodist clergy who served as chaplains. I did find some, but not enough and not with enough good stories to, to warrant the, the time spent um, to do preparation. So Belfast, or sorry, um, Presbyterian Church of Ireland chaplains. Going to sort of start off with a wee bit about chaplains in general. Chaplains who served during the Great War provided a wide range of different services. They provided vital spiritual support to the troops, which included delivering um, weekly church services and administering communion as and where required by the relevant denomination. They also provided um, pastoral support and comfort to soldiers who had lost friends or relatives. They helped the men to write letters home, and they often wrote letters to fellow ministers back home to advise them of the deaths of men from their congregation or presbytery. And I'm going to be reading out some of these later on. They also often acted as stretcher bearers going out on the battlefields to bring in wounded men. They worked as orderlies in field ambulances and regimental aid posts and other hospitals. And they also had the more solemn duty of conducting the burial of fatalities. Commonwealth War Graves Commission database records that 177 men died during the Great War while serving with the Army Chaplains Department. That would just be the British Army. There would have been chaplains um, who would have been associated with the Canadians, the South Africans, um, New Zealanders and Australians, and also, of course, with the Americans when they eventually joined in. 42 of the records do not contain any next of kin or address details. And this obviously makes it difficult to identify a precise number for a region. So it's very difficult to actually identify how many Ulster men who were chaplains actually died. However, at least 19 of the fatalities can be identified as, as being from Ireland. And a further four were chaplains attached to Irish regiments. So when you're looking at that, you're talking about maybe some the the mid twenties would be a reasonable figure for chaplains from from Ireland. According to Commonwealth War Grave records, thirteen ministers while serving with the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA. I've identified only one man from Ireland in that number, and that's an Ulster Presbyterian about whom I'll be speaking later. It should be borne in mind that ministers who served with other regiments also lost their lives. So a lot of um, ministers gave up their um, their position and joined infantry, joined medical corps, um, artillery and other regiments. From preparing this talk, I think that the number of gallantry awards to chaplains is probably disproportionate given their relatively small number. Within the Presbyterian community, one chaplain from Ulster was awarded the, the Distinguished Service Order. Five were awarded the Military Cross and many more were mentioned in dispatches, and several were mentioned in dispatches on several occasions. Another bit of background. Um, during the Great Presbyterian Church in Ireland encouraged congregations to record details of their members who were serving in the war. In the aftermath of the war, the church um, amalgamated all these records and published the Presbyterian Church in Ireland's Roll of Honour as a book. This covered the whole of Ireland, and listed those who served by presbytery and then by congregation. Whilst not all congregations submitted returns, the role of honour includes over 24,000 names, and it has been estimated that up to 2,000 names might be missing from this role. There is a special section, um, as you can see on the, the side of the screen over here, the manse role of honour which in addition to the names of ministers' sons and ministers' daughters who served, records the names of 41 ministers. Many served as official chaplains, 
Some served with the YMCA, whilst others served with army units such as the Royal Army Medical Corps, artillery, infantry regiments, and some could have served with the, the Red Cross as well. This Road of Honour is owned by the Presbyterian Historical Society of Ireland, and a copy is held um, by the Linen Hall Library, and it's available to peruse. It's also been published by the Naval and Military Press, albeit without permission of the owners. And um, the Road of Honour has been transcribed and can be accessed on Eddie's Extracts website, which is run by <coughs> Edward Con Connolly, a fellow member of History Hub Ulster. I've included the, uh, the web address for Eddie's Extracts. So looking at Presbyterians, that's the place to go as a start point. In August 1914, three Presbyterian chaplains stationed at Aldershot were deployed to France with the British Expeditionary Force. And I'm going to start off with probably the most senior army chaplain from Ulster, probably from Ireland, in the Great War. And that was the Reverend John Morrow Sims. He was born around 1855 and was educated at Newtonard's Model School, Belfast Academy, which is now BRA, and Coleraine Academical Institution. After a short period of in the linen trade in Belfast, he entered Queen's College in Galway and then Queen's College in Belfast in 1877. He studied theology in Belfast, Edinburgh and Leipzig and was licensed by the Convert Presbytery as a candidate for the ministry. At the end of the year 1879, he received the call to minister at Burr in Kings County, a position that included providing chaplaincy services um, at the nearby camp at the Curra. In 1882, he accepted the call to minister at Third Ball in the Hinge Presbyterian Church, and he was then appointed as a chaplain to the forces in 1887, being initially based at the Curra. He served under Lord Kitchener in the Sudan campaign of 1896 to 1898, being involved in the battles of Atbara and Khartoum. He was mentioned in dispatches twice and was awarded the Queen's Sudan Medal and the Khedive's Medal. And that came with two clasps. The Khedive would have been the, the local warlord, for want of a better phrase. During that campaign, he also performed the memorial service for General Gordon at Onderman. Of course, um, the Sudan campaign was made famous by Corporal Jones in Dad's army. Um, he served in the Second Anglo-Boer War between 1899 and 1901, being attached to the Rhodesia Frontier Force and the 1st Battalion C. 4th Highlanders. He was awarded the Queen's South Africa Medal with Cape Colony, Orange Free State, Transvaal and Rhodesia clasps, and then served in the Somaliland Campaign, being awarded the Afri African General Service Medal. In this um, black and white newspaper photograph, I've lined up what those medals look like. So. We've got the Sudan medal, um, the Queen's South Africa medal, um, the Somaliland and, and, so, and so forth. So just to give you an idea of what those medals looked like um, and what the ribbons looked like, I've included them there. So he was posted to France as a principal chaplain to the British Expeditionary Force on 8th August 1914. That's four days after the start of the war. Um, and he went with the, the rank of Brigadier General, which meant that he oversaw the work of chaplains from all denominations. Um, accounts differ, but over 50 chaplains went to France in August 1914. And by June 1915, there were over 400 chaplains on active service. And this man would have had oversight of the work of a considerable number of those chaplains. He was later appointed as honorary chaplain to King George, the first time that this honour had been accorded to a minister of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. During the war, he also had the honour of baptising Earl Haig's son, or General Haig's son, as he would have been then. In the 1915 King's Birthday Honours, he was made a companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, and he was mentioned in the dispatches published in June 1915, January 1916, May 1917 and December 1917. He was promoted to Major General in November 1917 and made a Companion of the Order of Bath in September 1918. After his army service, he was in 1919, he was selected to be the moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Whilst moderator, he was involved in unveiling numerous 
memorial tablets in Presbyterian churches, and he continued to be in demand for war memorial dedications after his term of office ended in May 1920. In December 1923, he was returned as a Conservative member of the House of Commons to represent County Down, and he remained an MP until 1932. John Morrow Sims um, died at Scrabble Wiles Newton Arts on Sunday 29th April 1934, aged 79. He left a personal estate valued at £25,746, 13 shillings and tuppence, and that would equate to 1.96 million in current terms. He made bequests of £200 each to Ernest William Simmons, who was his chauffeur while he was on active service in France, Janet McClaymont, his housekeeper, Emily McAdoo, McAdoo his cook, and Patrick Grimes, his chauffeur. There was a bequest of £500 to Strain Presbyterian Church in Newton Arts, and that was to be used for charitable purposes. The insignia of his two orders and his military service medals were left to the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. And I'm not sure where they are now or whether they're on display. The second chaplain, Presbyterian chaplain, to go to France in August 1918 was Hugh Craig Meek. He was a chaplain at Aldershot Barracks. He was born on 15th February 1872 at Lissadean Mulliglass in County Armagh to the Reverend James Meek and Margaret Craig. He was minister of Ballyluny Presbyterian Church near Ballyclare from 1899 to 1904, being commissioned as a chaplain to the forces on 4th January 1905. He married Nora Coffey on 28th March 1906 at Donor Presbyterian Church in Dublin. He was posted to France with the BEF in August 1914 and was award, awarded the Distinguished Service Order in the 1918 Birthday Honours List. And he was mentioned in dispatches published in October 1914, June 1915, February 1917 and June 1918. So the first two men we've talked about went to France in the very early days of the war and were also mentioned in dispatches, both of them four times one of them being awarded the Distinguished Service Order. And I've just realized I've got the Distinguished Conduct Medal on that slide by accident or by mistake. The third of the chaplains to go to France in August 1914 was Joseph Lynn, and he was born on 30th September 1887 at Great James Street in Londonderry to Joseph Lynn, who is a coach builder, and Annabella Rogers. He studied at Queen's College and Assemblies College in Belfast, McRae McKee College in Londonderry, New College in Edinburgh and the University of London. He was assistant to the Reverend James McConaughey at Fort William Park Presbyterian Church when the Gover governing committee of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland nominated him for appointment as a chaplain to the forces. Ordained as chaplain at Great James Street in Presbyterian Church in Londonderry on 28th March 1913 and was stationed at Aldershot when he married Alicia Martha Clendinning at Fort William Park Presbyterian Church on 12th March 1914. He went to France with the rank of captain and was attached to 5th Field Ambulance, which was part of the 2nd Division. He was with his unit during the engagements at Mons, the Aisne, the Marne and Ypres. On 20th October 1914, the Belfast Newsletter published a short article entitled Life in a Field Ambulance, Letters from a Presbyterian Chaplain. And this is an extract from one of the letters he wrote to his mother. We are still at the farmhouse on the Aisne, but there is a rumour that the Germans are giving way and that we shall soon be on the move again. We can sit in the garden all day and then at night have a fine big fire on the hearth in the dining room. The owner of the place was here lately and was very pleased to see that the house was not burned down completely, as so many had been by the Germans. Anything like the havoc wrought here you never saw. Furniture smashed and thrown on the road, empty champagne bottles, houses burned and smashed with shells, people murdered, others wandering homeless towards um, Paris. And all this quite apart from the terror of the actual fighting itself. However, we never try to think of these things and keep very cheery. We have a gramophone and it is turned on in the evenings. We go to bed at 9.30, up at 7, breakfast at 8, lunch at 1, tea at 4.30 and dinner at 8. You'd think all they did 
when they were in France was was eight. We were we are fed splendidly. We are very few wounded, so are having an easy time. We spend the days loafing, reading, writing, and chatting. And then when it gets dark at five thirty, I go for a good walk. Safer than. A month later, the content and tone of a letter that he wrote to his brother is very different. It was under the headline, Hospital Cell by Germans, Ulster Chaplain's Experiences at the Front. As you will have seen, we have had a very rough time out here. That battle at Mons with retreat and constant fighting for 10 days was bad enough, but the battles the Marne and the Aisne were far worse. This Battle of Ypres puts the cap on all. There are hundreds of thousands of troops, guns, etc., and the last thousands of casualties. Fighting has continued all the time for a month, and things are no forwarder. Of course, the Germans will never break through here as long as we stick at it, as we are doing, as we are doing. I had some narrow escapes before this, but I got a real fright a fortnight ago in Ypres when on two occasions shells burst within 20 yards of me in the market square and I was badly shaken. A man beside me had his leg blown off and there was guns, um, and this was from, from guns at least six miles off. We got a shell in our hospital building and had a clear out. And as we were leaving the town, we were nearly caught again. Yesterday, I had to ride 10 miles to see some wounded and had a very hot time. The weather has been very good lately, but it is awful now, ice and sleet and cold. However, I am very fit and quite content doing my duty for old England. And I think if you look at the content of those two letters written at round about the same time, you can see that the letter to his mother was very much um, reduced in the, the <coughs> pardon me, the horrors of the war. <coughs> Whereas he was more honest, more um, open about the conditions when he wrote to his brother. John Lynn was mentioned in General Sir John Francis Dispatched, published in February 1915, and was later attached to 2nd Battalion King's Own Scottish Borderers. In February 1917, he was appointed as Senior Chaplain to the 34th Division with the rank of Major. He remained with the Army Chaplain's Department after the war and was a Deputy Chaplain General in 1935 when he was awarded an honorary degree by Queen's University in Belfast, becoming a Doctor of Divinity. He was appointed as an honorary chaplain to the King in 1936 and was made a commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire the following year. He retired as an army chaplain in January 1940. The Reverend Joseph Lynn died at hospital in Stirling in December 1956 at the age of 60. The only Presbyterian um, chaplain from Ulster to die while serving as an army with as with the army chaplain department was the Reverend Alexander Stewart of Bassbrook Presbyterian Church. Alexander Stewart was born on 14th August 1880 at May McCullen near Tandragee to the Reverend um, Joseph Crawford Stewart and Sarah Jane Fleming. His widow, widowed mother um, moved to Belfast and lived at 54 Brookvale Avenue. Alex Stewart was the grandson and son of Presbyterian ministers, and three of his brothers were also um, Presbyterian ministers. He was assistant minister at Agnes Street Presbyterian Church in Belfast before accepting the call from Bestbrook. And he was ordained there on 21st May 1913. In 1916, he was given six months leave of absence to serve with the YMCA in Malta and Egypt. He was given a further leave of absence in 1917 to serve as an official army chaplain. He died two weeks after joining his unit in France. Alexander Stewart was attached to 12th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles when he was killed in action on 24th October 1917 at the age of 37. He is, he is buried at Royal, Royal Court Military Cemetery in France and commemorated on a family memorial in Kulnadi Presbyterian Church graveyard. And that's not far from Kilray in County Londonderry. He is also commemorated on the Bestbrook War Memorial. The first of the MC winners from Presbyterian chaplains was John Jackson Wright, who was born on 8th April 1866 
in Ochnacloy to John Wright, a merchant, and Margaret Ann Jackson. He was educated at the Intermediate School in Ochnacloy, Queen's College in Belfast, and Assemblies College in Belfast. He was ordained in 1893, and his first charge was at Ballygoni Presbyterian Church near Money Moor. He remained there for 14 years before being installed as minister of Ballyshannon Presbyterian Church in County Donegal in August 1908. In October 1914, he was nominated as a part-time chaplain to the Ulster Division with responsibility for the men at Finner Camp. And then he was made a full-time chaplain in November the same year, and he accompanied the Ulster Division to France in October 1915. The onus, as I said before, fell on chaplains to inform their fellow ministers when a fatality from their, co their congregation occurred. In March 1916, John Jackson Wright wrote to the Reverend Thomas McRae of Balachi Presbyterian Church with regard to the death of Private Henderson Moore of the 10th Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers. I am sorry to inform you that H. Moore from Ballymacoom was killed on Friday night by shrapnel. I shall be grateful if you will tell his relatives how sorry we are to lose him. He was an exceedingly, exceedingly good soldier and a great favourite with his comrades. His, his officer speaks in the highest terms of his quiet, steady disposition and ready willingness for his duties. The funeral was on Saturday evening and along with four comrades he lies in a little cemetery specially reserved for British troops. We had a simple service at the graveside and it may be some consolation to know that his death was instantaneous and the interment was sadly and reverently done. Reverend John Jackson Wright was awarded the Military Cross in the 1970s New Year's Honours List. For those of you who aren't familiar with um, the process for Military Crosses, uh, when a person was awarded the Military Cross in one of the Honours Lists, either in January or June, there was no citation published and it was recognition for a series of acts of gallantry which in their own right none of which would have um met this met the the criteria for the for a full military cross so a number of small incidents were amalgamated together and then the man was issued um with the military cross for those actions Apologies for the poor quality of these two photographs, best I could find. James Gilbert Patton was born at the Free Church Manse in Chapelton in Ayrshire on 20th April 1882 and was educated at Foyle College and um, McRae McGee College in Londonderry, where he was awarded the Gowdy Scholarship worth 10 quid and the JL Beggar Memorial Scholarship, which was eight pounds. He was at Ballykelly Presbyterian Church when he was appointed as assistant and successor to the Reverend Wiley at Downshire Road Presbyterian Church in Newry. He was appointed as Minister of Terrace Road Presbyterian Church in October 1913, that's in Coleraine, and obtained leave of absence to serve with the YMCA in France in June 1915. Shortly after returning to his congregation, the Reverend Patton was appointed as an army chaplain in December 1915. James Gilbert Patton was awarded the Military Cross in the June 1917 um, King's Birthday Honours List and was awarded a bar in September 1918. The citation reading, for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty, under heavy shell and machine gun fire, he helped to evacuate wounded and in one instance helped to carry a seriously wounded case four miles to an aid station. He showed fine, a fine disregard for personal safety and a devotion to duty. The Reverend Patton was attached to 2nd Battalion in Skilling Fusiliers when he was awarded the second bar to the Military Cross in February 1919, the citation being published the following July. For great courage and devotion to during the attack on Murseal and Gulegem on October 14th and 15th, 1918, he never spared himself. He worked continuously through the operations in and tending wounded, frequently passing through heavy fire to forward positions to reach the wounded. His gallant, gallant conduct and untiring efforts were admirable. James Gilbert Patton returned to Terrace Row Presbyterian Church in 1918 after serving as a chaplain on the Western Front for three years. In March 1920, he became Minister of Malone Presbyterian Church 
Guerry re remained until his death on 22nd February 1936, having served as the moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland in 1931-32. He was 53 years old when he died and is buried in Belfast City Cemetery. In 1946, um, the Patton Memorial Hall was erected and dedicated in memory of the very Reverend Dr. James Gilbert Patton, MC and two bars. And it's not often that an ordinary officer gets um, two bars to an MC, but for a chaplain who would probably have been unarmed um, for most of his, his time at the front, it's quite an achievement. And I don't think I've come across any other chaplains during this research who have received two bars to a military cross. <laughs> William Holmes Hutchison was born at Bellevue Road in Dublin on 21st January 1878 to James Hutchison, a lithographer, and Henrietta Holmes. In 1901, he was a bookkeeper and living with his widowed mother and four siblings at Twickenham Street in Belfast. Two of his brothers were working as clerks and his 18-year-old sister was an office apprentice. He was a member of St. Enoch's Presbyterian Church in Belfast when he decided to enter the ministry. He studied at Queen's College in Belfast, graduating in 1904, and undertook his theological training at the Assemblies College. He was licensed by the Presbytery of Belfast in May 1908, as assistant to the Reverend Charles Davy at Fisherwick Presbyterian Church. He accepted the call to Cunningham Memorial Presbyterian Church in Cullibaki and was ordained there in May 1910. William Holmes Hutchison was moderator of the Synod of Ballymena in Coleraine when the war started. He enlisted with the motor section of the, of the Army Service Corps and went to France as a dispatch rider in September 1916. He was commissioned as a chaplain in February 1917, and in August 1918, he was admitted to hospital suffering from gas poisoning and was awarded the Military Cross for his action two months later whilst detached to 1st Battalion Royal Irish Rifles. The award was announced in February 1919, and the citation was published five months later. Under heavy machine, Delphi fired during the operation south of Dadazil, on October 2nd, 1918, he helped to evacuate and rendered first aid to the wounded with complete disregard for personal safety. He assisted to carry two seriously wounded men from the front line to the regimental aid post, a distance of about one kilometer. He returned to the front line and continued dressing the wounded under heavy fire. His gallantry and conspicuous conduct during the entire operation were marked by all ranks. William Holmes Hutchison returned to his ministry at Cunningham Memorial um, before being ordained as the minister of Ballywillan Presbyterian Church near Port Rush in 1932. He married Dr. Isabel Alexander on 26th July 1937 at Fisherwick Presbyterian Church in Belfast. On Sunday 23rd August 1953, he dedicated a new standard for the Port Rush branch of the British Legion and he died the following day at the age of 75, although his age was registered as 71. So his last act as a minister was to dedicate a British Legion standard. At the funeral service, his coffin was draped with the Union flag and the British Legion standard. He was buried in the family burial ground in Island McGee. David Sloan Corky was born on 1st December 1882 at Glendermott Mounts near Londonderry to the Reverend Joseph Corky and Isabella Sloan. Not only was he the, the son of a Presbyterian minister, but he was a brother to eight Presbyterian ministers. One of his sisters married a Presbyterian minister and two other sisters were Presbyterian ministries, sorry, Presbyterian missionaries. David Corky played rugby from Lone Football Club and represented Ulster. He was assistant to the Reverend Henry Montgomery at the Shankill Road Mission for four years before becoming minister at Dundrod Presbyterian Church in February 1911. He married Thomasina Agnes McConnell on 10th December 1912 at Townsend Street Presbyterian Church, where his brother was the minister. David Corky was appointed as a chaplain on 7th May 1915 
and was immediately posted to France. He was serving as chaplain to the 27th Field Ambulance at Cambrin when he was hit by shrapnel in the side of the head on 28 September. And he did that occurred whilst he was helping to bring in wounded men. The following month, he was mentioned in dispatches by Sir, um, General Sir, George, Sir John French, and that dispatch was uh, published in the London Gazette on the 1st of January 1916. In May 1916, he was attached to 11th Battalion Royal Scots when he was severely injured in the left arm by shrapnel whilst on duty at the regimental aid post. His left arm had to be amputated and he was evacuated to England where he was treated at the Lady Northcliffe's Hospital for Officers in London. His colonel wrote that Corky's absence was an irreparable loss to the battalion and his divisional um, general urged him to return as soon as he was quite fit as, quote, the regiment needs spiritual reinforcement as much as any form of ammunition. While on convalescence leave, he preached at Townsend Street Presbyterian Church in September before returning to France in late October 1916. Shortly after his return to France, his 37-year-old wife died on 24th November at a private hospital on Fitzroy Avenue from complications following a laparotomy to clear a bile, deduct, bile duct obstruction. David Corky was attached to the 36th Ulster Division Base Depot at Le Havre when he was admitted to number eight General Hospital on 10th January 1917, suffering from influenza, influenza, and he returned to duty on 16th January. The Reverend David Sloan Corky was officially welcomed back to the Dun congregation at a social evening held on 21st May 1919 and he was presented with a framed illuminated address. In his speech he spoke about the experiences of the troops in France. When all, one always felt hopelessly unable to speak adequately regarding those brave men. They had so much to go through that no one could realize that what they had endured except those who had been with them Nothing could ever repay those men for what they had done, and they could not do much for the fighting men who had returned. They could not do too much for the fighting men who had returned from the war. On 23rd November 1920, he married for the second time to Henrietta Constance Lowry at St. Patrick's Church of Ireland in Coleraine. David Cole's medical and mental condition deteriorated due to a cerebral tumour which had commenced during his war service, but hadn't been diagnosed until 1924. He went through two operations in London on Friday the 10th of October, but both were unsuccessful. And David Corky died on Tuesday 14th October 1924. He was just 41 years old when he died, and he's buried in the graveyard at Dundrod Presbyterian Church. Captain David Sloan Corky is the first man named on the memorial tablet in Dundrod Presbyterian Church and the last, mate, the last man named on the tablet was his voted order, orderly, William J. McGrain. William McGrain was not a member of the congregation, was not a Presbyterian and indeed he was not even a Protestant. He's probably the only Roman Catholic to be named on a war memorial tablet in a Presbyterian Church in Ireland. And you can see that um, the inscription for, for his entry is also Private William J. McGrain, the devoted orderly of Captain Corky. The YMCA also played a key role um, in the war effort in France as well as camps in and around the United Kingdom. They established huts in various theatres of war, most notably on the Western Front. The Red Triangle huts, as they were called, provided a place where off-duty men could meet for reading, refreshments and recreation, to have a shower or bath, to seek a listening ear or to write letters home. The YMCA volunteers also worked in hospitals and convalescent camps alongside staff from the Royal Army Medical Corps and the Red Cross. Drivers from the YMCA provided transport for rel relatives visiting the wounded in hospitals or attending funerals. It was not uncommon for ministers to take a leave of absence from their congregations to carry out voluntary work for the YMCA for limited, for limited periods, usually between three and six months. 
Some ministers carried out several tours of duty with the YMCA. This image of YMCA volunteers appears in the Weekly Telegraph in May 1916 and includes two ministers from Ulster who I've ringed. The man standing is the Reverend Leggett of Groomsport and the man seated um, was the Reverend Moore of Second Inch. Whilst official army chaplains who served in the theatre of war were entitled to re receive a star medal if they met the criteria, the British Medal and the Victory Medal. However, ministers who served as YMCA volunteers in a theatre of war were only entitled to receive the British War Medal, which is the medal I have depicted on the screen there. Um, so the, the man um, standing at the back there, this is him, John Nesbitt Moorhead Leggett, was born on 24th July 1877 at Ballinure to the Reverend Ebenezer Martin Leggett and Jenny Moorhead. He was educated at Queen's College and Assemblies College in Belfast and became Minister of Raffery Presbyterian Church in County Down in 1904. John Leggett married Isabella Rebecca Maxwell of Templemore in County Londonderry on 12th April 1910. He became Minister of Groomsport Presbyterian in August 1911 and was a founding member of Groomsport Masonic Lodge 357 in 1913. In January 1916, he was given leave of absence by the Arts Presbytery to undertake work in connection with the YMCA. After completing his six month period of service, service with the YMCA, Reverend Leggett returned to Groomsport. He was then commissioned as an army chaplain in September 1917 and served on the Western Front until he resigned his commission in June 1919. He returned to his ministry at Groomsport Presbyterian Church before moving to First Coal Rain Presbyterian Church in 1921. He was awarded the British War Medal and, he and the Victory Medal and he retired from the ministry in 1950. He retired to Groomsport and died at Bangor Hospital on 14th March 1965, aged 87, and is buried in Coal Rain Cemetery. So although he um, originally um, went to France to work with the YMCA, because that alone would have entitled him to the British um, War Medal. But because he was then ordained as a chaplain or appointed as a full army chaplain, that then entitled him to have the, um, the Victory Medal as well. Another YMCA volunteer was Edwin Piper, who was born on 26th March 1868 at Old Lodge Road in Belfast. And his parents were Thomas Piper, a grocer, and Margaret Ann Kerr. The family lay later lived at a house called Clifton in the Strandtown area of Belfast. He served as an assistant minister at Birkenhead in Liverpool and then at Ballymacarrick before being ordained in Annalong Presbyterian Church on 13th December 1910. Edwin Piper married Edith Florence Jones on 12th, 21st August 1912 at Trinity Church in Birkenhead. In December 1916, he was released by his congregation and the Newry Presbytery to serve in France with the YMCA. He returned to Annelong from France in March 1917 at the age of 48 and ministered at the congregation until his retirement in March 1945. He died at Annelong Mance on 20th July 1949 at the age of 81 and is buried in the church graveyard there. The only Presbyterian minister from Ulster to die while serving with the YMCA was William Andrew Wilson of New Row Presbyterian Church in Coleraine. He was born on 4th May 1869 at Minterburn Mance near Tynan to the Reverend Andrew James Wilson and Isabella Moffat Thompson. He was licensed as an assistant to the Reverend Robert Wallace in New Row um, in 1894 and was installed as Wallace's successor in March 1896. He was to spend the rest of his ministry with that congregation. He married Ellen Forsyth Smith on 27th April 1898 at Woodville in Coleraine by special license. William and Ellen Wilson and their two sons were on a visit to France in August 1914 and when the war commenced um, it was with great difficulty that they managed to, to make their way back to Ireland and to Ulster. 
William Andrew Wilson commenced his first tour of duty with the YMCA in France in May 1916. And he commenced his third tour in December 1917, when he did his um, second tour. The following information comes from a booklet entitled Memorials to Chaplains in the Great War that was published in 2020. And I'll mention a wee bit more about the, that at the end of the um, talk. On the morning of, of Wednesday, 20th March, 1918, William Wilson visited several of the YMC huts at Abbeville with Colonel Austin, Chaplain General to the Forces at Le Havre. After lunch, they set out for Le, Le Trepor, where William intended to visit his brother, the Reverend George Wilson, and his brother-in-law, the Reverend Frederick William Scott O'Neill, who were both Presbyterian ministers working with the YMCA. The Daimler car in which they were travelling lost the wheel and swerved to the left. The chauffeur steered to the right to avoid hitting a high bank, but the car plunged down a steep embankment into a field. The chauffeur died in the crash, Colonel Austin was uninjured, and William Wilson received a, a head wound which seemed to be superficial. He was taken by ambulance to the number two British General Hospital in Le Havre, where he died two hours later. He was 48 years old and is buried in the Santa Marie Cemetery in Le Havre, his funeral service being conducted by a YMCA comrade, the Reverend Professor Francis James Paul of McCree McGee College in Londonderry. And you can see there the uh, Commonwealth Wargraves headstone. Even though he was YMCA, because he died in France, he qualifies to receive um, the same type of headstone as anyone else that died as a result of the war. And um, down at the bottom, um, under the cross, it says, Minister New Row Ireland, 1894 to 1918, a man greatly loved. This is the War Memorial Tablet for the First World War in Dunmurray Presbyterian Church. And as far as I'm aware, it's the only memorial where YMCA volunteers have been listed separately. Um, the first man named in the under YMCA is or was the Reverend Robert Davy, who had been ordained as minister of the congregation on 8th July 1902. He spent four months in France with the YMC, YMCA, returning to his ministry at Dunmurray in March 1919, which means he must have gone to France round about October, November. Um, so he would have been there to the war had ended, but whilst a lot of the prisoners would still be coming back through and a lot of reorganization. The Reverend David retired on 31st December 1945 after a ministry of 43 years, and he died on 16th December 1946. His son, Robert Raymond Davy, was also a Presbyterian minister and was ordained for field work with the YMCA War Service in North Africa in 1940. He helped to establish a centre in Tobruk for use by all faiths to care for the social, physical and spiritual needs of those engaged in desert warfare. He was taken captive in 1942 and held as a prisoner of war near Dresden, where he witnessed the Allied bombing of the city. He later formed the Corrie Miller community up near Ballycastle. So it's quite ironic that both father and son would both be uh, serving with the YMCA in two separate world wars. On 7th June 1921, a tablet commemorating the six Presbyterian ministers who died during the Great War was unveiled in the Assembly Building by Robert Sinclair Knox, DSO. This memorial tablet um, was misplaced during renovations to the buildings, and I've been unable to locate a good image of the tablet. But the newspaper at the time has listed the, the six men who were named on the memorial. Two of the men listed died serving with the Royal Army Medical Corps, one with the Royal Garrison Artillery, one as an army chaplain who I've already mentioned, and one as an R as a volunteer who I just um, talked about a few minutes ago. 
The sixth man was um, the Reverend John Robert Bartley of Tralee Presbyterian Church. And he was traveling to London to visit his son, Sergeant William Bartley, who had been severely wounded in, in August 1918 while serving with the Manitoba Regiment. And he was receiving at the Tooting Military Hospital. The Reverend Bartley lost his life when RMS um, Leinster was torpedoed and sunk on 10th October 1918. Sergeant William Bartley died of his wounds six days later. Father and son, both victims of the war, are buried in the same plot in Tralee New Cemetery. Um, he's been included on that memorial tablet, not because he was an army chaplain or because he served in the war, but because he was he died as a direct result of German enemy action. The last biography that I want to cover relates to a Presbyterian minister who died while serving on the Western Front, but not as a chaplain. James Lawrence Rentoul was born in quarter three of 1885 at Darlington in Durham to Robert and Reed Rentoul, a Presbyterian minister, and Caroline Wiley Beatty. James Lawrence Rentoul was assistant minister at Rosemary Street Presbyterian before answering the call to Ross Trevor Presbyterian Church in 1914. He married Agnes Eileen Moore in September 1914 by special license at her family home, Ard Lynn, which is in Adelaide Park in Belfast. James Lawrence Rentoul volunteered for active service with the Royal Army Medical Corps in May 1917 and was serving as a stretcher bearer with 91st Field Ambulance when a German sh shell landed in the dugout, dugout on 30th September 1918, killing him and two of his comrades. He was 33 years old and is buried in La Bar British Cemetery in France. A memorial tablet was erected in Ross Trevor Presbyterian Church and the Reverend James Lawrence Rentoul is also commemorated on the Roll of Honour for Rosemary Street Presbyterian Church in Belfast, where he had served his assistantship. In 2020, the Presbyterian Historical Society of Ireland and the Presbyterian Church in Ireland's Council for Mission in Ireland produced a booklet containing biographical information about the six Presbyterian ministers who died during the Great War, along with details of three students for the Presbyterian ministry who died while serving in the army. The booklet can be obtained from the Presbyterian Historical Society in Ireland. And that brings the talk to an end.